Grace to you and peace from our Lord Jesus Christ. You've made your way to worship at First Presbyterian Church of Deerfield online. I'm Pastor Susan Hawkinson, and I'd like to call us into worship wherever you are. I hope that you will recognize and feel that we are connected by the Holy Spirit who makes us one. I invite you as we go through the call to worship to share a response. When I lift my right hand, I invite you to say the phrase wherever you are, great is your name, great is your love you will be making proclamation about who God is. Great is your name, great is your love. Let us be called to worship. Oh God, you summon the day to dawn. You teach the morning to wake in the earth. Great is your name, great is your love. For you, the valleys will sing for joy. The trees of the field shall clap their hands. Great is your name, great is your love. To you, the monarchs of the earth shall bow. The poor and the persecuted shall shout for joy. Great is your name, great is your love. Your love and justice shall last forever. Fresh as the morning, sure as the sunrise. Great is your love, great is your name. Let us be called to worship. The time of confession is really just a spiritual practice that helps us move from the ordinary every day to recognize that we stand before God and that with God watching us, we begin the conversation by saying, Lord, help me see also. Will you join me as we share a prayer of confession? Great God, we seek your face. We seek you. We confess that we find ourselves freshly aware of the vulnerable exposures of human life. We are susceptible to illness, to accident, to error, to sin. 
We cannot undo the past. We cannot control the present. We cannot command the future. Apart from your love, from your help, we are lost. Lord, in your mercy, bear us up. Lead us forward. Gird our hope. We rest our lives in your grace. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. hear the good news of the gospel and be assured of your forgiveness. God is our refuge and our strength, a very present help in trouble. Let your hearts be unafraid. The steadfast love of the Lord endures forever. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, receive the forgiveness of the Lord. Amen. Good morning, friends. I am so glad to have this time with our youngest disciples. Today, we're gonna hear about a story that Susan is going to preach on. I first saw the story told by a woman named Amanda White, and she did it so well, I'm gonna to try to replicate what she did. You see, the story starts with a man. And this was a wonderful man, but he had a problem. He was a paraplegic. It means he couldn't walk. In fact, he couldn't stand. Most of the time, he had to lay on the ground and beg for help and assistance. It was a rough way to live in Jesus' day and in ours. But the great thing about this man is that he had four amazing friends. These four buddies of his cared for him and loved him. And they had heard something very interesting. They had heard that a man named Jesus was in town. He was at another person's house and they had this crazy idea. They thought they'd build a bed, put their friend on it, and then carry him on the bed all the way to this other house. And that's what they did. When they got there, of course, they looked in the window. But guess what? The room was packed. It was so full that there was no way they'd be able to get their friend in there. Certainly not on that great big bed. But there was something else they noticed. There were some stairs around back. The stairs led to the roof. And so guess what they did? They picked up their friend, they walked up the stairs, and they decided to start to make a hole in the roof. They kept pulling more and more pieces of the roof apart. And when the hole was big enough, they put some ropes on the edge of the bed and lowered it into the room. Once the bed was inside the room, Jesus immediately saw the man. I'm sure they talked, and I'm sure Jesus felt terrible for the man's situation. And at some point, Jesus said the most interesting, amazing thing. He said, your sins are forgiven. Get up. What? Everybody around said, how can you say this? Who do you think you are, Jesus? Do you think you're God? You can't tell that man his sins are forgiven. Jesus said, well, is it easier just to have him stand? So sure enough, Jesus asked the man to stand up, and he did. He said, see, your sins are forgiven. You've been made whole. Jesus reminded the man that he was loved by God. He rolled up his mat. They celebrated their friends who had such tremendous faith that they would bring him to Jesus, and off they went. I can't help but to think that this story reminds me of another story of God's love. It's a story of the cross. It's that Jesus loves you and me so much that Jesus wants us to be made whole too. 
Jesus wants to forgive our sins as well. Jesus wants us to know that God loves us no matter what. Isn't that beautiful? I hope today you'll remember the man who was paraplegic. I hope you'll remember how much his friends loved him. And I hope you'll remember how much Jesus loved all of them. Will you pray with me? Dear God, we thank you for sending Jesus down here to earth to teach us how to live and how to be. We thank you for the love that he showed us, even onto the cross. Lord, be with us this day and help us to love others as much as you have loved us. Amen. Have a great day. Our scripture lesson this morning is read for us today by Kathy Clulo, one of the newest members of our congregation. I invite you into friendship with Kathy and into the word of the Lord. Today's scripture lesson is a scene in Jesus' everyday work as recounted in the Gospel of Mark. Everywhere Jesus went, the poor, the sick, the desperate, they all showed up wherever Jesus was asking for healing. But what if you were paralyzed and couldn't get yourself to Jesus? What if you were helpless to even help yourself or even to ask for help? Then the power that is in friendship can make all the difference in the world. Listen now as we hear in the text what happens when friends make another's troubles a burden that they are willing to share. The reading comes from the Gospel of Mark, chapter 2, verses 1 through 12. When he returned to Capernaum after some days, it was reported that he was at home. So many gathered around that there was no longer room for them, not even in the front door, and he was speaking the word to them. Then some people came, bringing to him a paralyzed man, carrying, cared, who? Then some people came, bringing to him a paralyzed man, carried by four of them. And when they could not bring him to Jesus because of the crowd, they removed the roof above him, and having dug through it, they let down the mat on which the paralytic lay. When Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralytic, Son, your sins are forgiven. Now some of the scribes were sitting there, questioning in their heart, Why does this fellow speak in this way? It's blasphemy. Who can forgive sins but God alone? At once, Jesus perceived in a spirit they were, that they were discussing these questions among themselves. And he said the, to them, why do you raise such questions in your hearts? Which is easier to say to the paralytic, your sins are forgiven, or to stay, stand up, take your mat, and walk? But so that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins, he said to the paralytic, I say to you, stand up, take your mat, and go to your home. And he stood up, and immediately took the mat and went out before all of them, so that all were amazed and glorified God, saying, We have never seen anything like this. The word of God for the people of God. Amen. She just finished an amazing floor hockey game. In the last few seconds of the game, she'd gotten the puck. She punched past the teammates on the other team. She made it to the goalie and flung that puck into the net. It snapped. The buzzer of the game went off. The cheers of the crowd went up. And just a few minutes later, everyone was leaving the gym, but not her. Her knees crumpled underneath her. She was down on the floor. She couldn't move. She couldn't breathe. The paramedics arrived in just a few moments. They were asking questions. I was paralyzed too. I, I couldn't think of what her last name was and she'd been my roommate for two years. There are all kinds of ways that we are paralyzed, that we are frozen in space, that we can't find ourselves a way to move. All it took was a paper bag for my friend. She just hyperventilated in the excitement, in the high of the wind. She couldn't breathe. And until she could breathe, 
nothing else in her body was working either. To some degree, all of us find ourselves sooner or later paralyzed. Here's another story. A man from our church showed up in my office one day. His face was ashen. He sat down in the chair in my office and he reached his hand into his pocket to pull out a literal pink slip. His job, the job at the bank where he'd worked for 24 years, his boss had come into him that afternoon to tell him that his job was over. And then he was compelled by a security officer to put all of his belongings into a box, walk them out to the parking lot and it was over for him. He sat in his car frozen there in the parking lot for a good two hours before he finally decided to come over to the church because it was the only place he could think of to come before he had to go home to tell his wife what had happened. He was frozen. He was paralyzed. He, he didn't know what to think. He didn't know what to do. And slowly, slowly, as we talked, as God's mercy poured over him, he began to remember that there were other stories that were true about him, other things about his strength, about his worthiness, about his capacity, and about God's love and call to him that would make the next story, even if the last was over. All of us, sooner or later, come to that frozen place where paralysis finds us all. Here's another story. A young woman, her voice was shaking on the phone. She was 36 years old and she had three children under the age of five. And she had just gotten off the phone with her doctor who had told her that she was about to embark on the journey of fighting a very grave form of cancer. There would be chemo, there would be radiation, and somewhere down the road there would be surgery. And there was only a little hope. She was paralyzed. The sobs took her shaking, but nothing else would move. She was so needed by her family. She so wanted to live. What was going to happen to her? She was frozen in place. She was being shoved into a darkness that made her feel powerless to resist. The man being lowered on the pallet into the house where Jesus was surrounded by a crowd, that man, that paralyzed man on the pallet is not the only human being who has experienced paralysis. Paralysis, it's a, it's a noun, you know what it means. It means the loss of the ability to move. Sometimes it means the loss of the capacity to feel anything. Its synonyms are powerless, immobility, numbness, halt, shutdown. Paralysis can be total or partial, but I don't need to tell you, do I? Perhaps you know of someone who is paralyzed, who can't move from where they are to move to the new there, physically, emotionally, socially, spiritually. Perhaps you know a little of your own paralysis. Where are you frozen? Where are you stopped? Where, where do you find yourself unable, no matter what, to move forward? Four friends, each presumably on one corner of a makeshift bed, carried this paralyzed man to Jesus. Well, Jesus, who was he? He was, he was the closest thing to God that the people in Capernaum had ever seen. Capernaum was a small first century fishing village. There weren't very many people who lived there, 1,500 maybe, but it was the big city next to Nazareth where Jesus had grown up and become a carpenter with his father. There was Jesus in the house there in Capernaum and the people of Capernaum, the people of Palestine were gathered thick around him. There was no room to get in at the door, no room to get in at the windows. And when the four friends carrying their friend on a pallet saw that, they wouldn't stop. What would make four friends do the trouble of taking this man on a pallet to Jesus? What would make them be brave enough to climb up on the roof? What would make them brave enough to tear the roof open just to get into Jesus? Let's consider first their love and their hope. How do they know the man? How do I know that they loved the man who was paralyzed? Because Whatever had happened to him, whatever had caused him to be frozen and helpless, didn't stop their love. This is love. They did for this man 
what he could not do for himself. The love of friendship always lifts up the friend. Friends don't just talk about loving, they lift the weight of doing it. True, true friendship looks like this. It sees what is out of the reach of our friend and it cr climbs the ladder to get it for them. True friendship doesn't just feel sympathy, it does sympathy. I was in church once where a young woman was going through cancer and the chemo that she was going through was taking away all of her hair. And she felt embarrassed and awkward and conspicuous, bald, no hair, a young woman. And this is what her friends did. A couple of them actually shaved their heads, sat beside her in church. A lot of others just started wearing hats right alongside her. When you love someone who is paralyzed, whether it's by fear or something else, you shape your own capacity to move the shape of what your friend would do if they could move. The man in our Bible story couldn't move on his own. So his friends took the weight of that limitation and moved their friend forward. But they didn't just move him anywhere. They moved him to Jesus. Yes, there were obstacles. There was the crowd, there was the roof, but they never ever took their eyes off moving their paralyzed friend to a place that would be better for him. They never took their hearts off their hope that moving their friend to Jesus would make all the difference in the world. Jesus looked up to the gaping hole in the roof of the house as the friends lowered the paralyzed man on a pallet through that hole in the roof. All eyes looked at Jesus, then to the man, wondering what would God do with this situation? Jesus looked to the friends and he saw their faith and he commented on it. And he simply told the man on the mat, your sins are forgiven. Whatever's happened before has been given back to you. The life that you had before whatever happened happened is forgiven to you. Well, that unsettled all the religious people standing there who questioned the brazenness of Jesus to be so presumptuous that they could speak, that he could speak for God. Because who can forgive sins except for God alone? Who can make things right when everything is wrong? But seeing through all of them, Jesus goes one better. Which is easier, he says, to forgive someone's sins or to say that or to tell them everything is new. Stand up, pick up your mat, walk. And so, so that Jesus could show them, the crowds and the man, that that's what God is like. That's what God is capable of. The man stood up on his new legs and he did just what Jesus said was possible. He picked up his mat and he walked. He walked out on the faith of his four friends. Andy Stanley once said, your friends will determine the quality and direction of your life. And I say, show me who is surrounding you, whose voices you're listening to, the loudest voice in your life, whose opinion matters to you the very most. And I will show you where you are heading in your life. And the best, the best friends change us in the best way by getting us to God's power in Jesus Christ, by helping us find that power in our own lives. The kind of friendship that we see in this story changes, stretches, heals, transforms, not only the man on the mat, but the friends who brought him. And the story forces us to ask a couple of questions. Will you hear these? Whose faith is changing your life? Who's helping you stand with more strength? Who's helping you carry the weight, the mat that you need to carry in your life? Whose faith is helping you walk? And here's another important question. Whose life is your faith changing? Who around you watching your faith is better able to stand and carry the weights that belong to them? Someone else's miracle 
might be on the other side of your faith showing. Someone else's need might be lifted by your faith showing up in your prayers and in your action. On the other side of the risks you decide to take with your faith, your encouragement, your checkbook, your inconvenience, your investment, your mercy, the decisions you make on the other side of those challenges, your faith in enacting them, someone else's miracle might be on the other side of all that. And by the way, the world is watching. As this story unfolds in scripture, the four men, the four friends bringing their friend on a mat, as this man got up out of his paralysis, picked up his mat and walked in front of them all, the crowd saw it. They saw the faith of the friends. They saw the healing of God. And they praised God for what they saw. These four friends didn't just love their friend. They let God show off just a little bit. Their friendship let Jesus show something of God's character, of God's kindness, of God's power. St. Francis once said, preach the gospel, use words if necessary. Jesus once said, as I have loved you, so you must love one another. By this, everyone watching, by this, everyone will know that you are just my disciples if you show up loving one another. What if people around us could see God's love because of the way we loved each other or feel God's love because of the way we loved them? Not just on our own strength, but on a faith that brought them to Jesus. One more story. You know I have to tell a Mr. Rogers story. We are in the series of Won't You Be My Neighbor inspired by Mr. Fred Rogers. Back in the mid 1960s, the problem of racism as it is today rose like a flame in our country. Racism then was so bad that people with black skin and people with white skin felt like they weren't supposed to do things together, like swim in a pool or date or go to school together, or go to church together. There were some terrible, terrible incidents where white people hurt black people who tried to cross the line. There was a scene in the news at that time on this new technology called television, by the way. It showed white people pouring bleach into a swimming pool while there were precious children with black skin swimming in it. They didn't want those people in that pool. It was a terrible, terrible time and racism was on display and who would speak a word against it? During that same time, the quiet Fred Rogers, purposefully and gently defiant, brought to the set of his own television program, a pool and Francois Clemens, a guest on his show, Francois is a black man, a gay man, and a good friend of Fred Rogers. Rogers saw the wrong that was happening in the world to people of color in his time, and he made it a point to bring his Fred friend onto the show to do a simple thing right there in front of God and everybody. Rogers brought a kiddie pool onto the set so no one would miss his point. He took off his shoes, he put his feet into the cool water, and he asked his friend Francois to do the same thing so that they could share the cool of the pool together, and so that they could powerfully speak a word about the gospel, about God's love, and about what friends do. There they were, a black man's feet and a white man's feet in the same pool together and Francois's beautiful voice lifting the simple song. There are many ways to say, I love you. There are many ways to show I love you. 
Francois Clemens. Hi, welcome. Thank you. How you doing? Fine. How are you today? Fine. My feet were tired, so I thought I'd just soak them for a while in this water. Does it make them feel better? It does. Would you like to try? Sure. Okay. Here, uh, have my seat there. Thank you. Take your uh, shoes and socks off, and I'll go get a chair for myself. surprised to see you here today. Well, I've been filling out over at the precinct for a couple of days while Joe's away on vacation. Uh-huh. Yeah, pull those up. Ah, Doesn't that, feel that good? does feel good. Mm. But uh, my assignment's just about over. I'm going to have to leave in a couple of days. Well, I was just talking with my television friends and thinking about uh, many different ways of saying I love you. Singing is one of my ways of saying I love you. Oh, I know that. Do you have time to, uh, to give a song to my friend and me? I sure do. There are many ways to say I love you. There are many ways to say I care about you. Many ways, many ways, many ways to say. As we said earlier, there are many, many ways to be paralyzed, and lots of us who are paralyzed in many ways. Since we have this in common, could we, I wonder, and I'm asking you to wonder, could we let our friendship help break what is frozen in us, between us? What could you do? What can you do to help someone, to help a friend pick up what weighs in their life? Help a friend get closer to God's power and kindness and mercy. How could you, by your prayers and by your actions, help another friend move past what is holding them back and walk on? I challenge you today. I think the story challenge all, challenges all of us to reach out and connect with a friend, to find out what's holding them back in this time, and to figure out what the best way for us to bring them to Jesus actually is. Be intentional. Be intentional about being a friend, a friend with faith to someone who won't be able to move if you won't help God's miracle come to them. Let others see, shall we, how great God's love is and how greatly and tenaciously we love. Amen. Softly sighs the of evening stealing through yon shady willow grove while the stars like guardian angels set their
Our prayer today was written by George McLeod, who lived between 1895 and 1991. <clears throat> After his experience in the trenches in the First World War, when he won a medal for bravery, he became a pacifist and a socialist. He was ordained as a minister in the Church of Scotland, serving slum parishes in Edinburgh and Glasgow. In 13 in 1938, he founded the Iona community. Large numbers were inspired by his religious ideals and met each other to discuss how to transform society. His robust prayers, while rooted in the concerns of his time, are universal in their application, since he sees God in all social situations and in all living creatures. On an island off the shores of Scotland, Iona continues to be a place that draws believers to prayer and engagement for the world. In the George MacLeod, let us pray together a prayer he titled, The Glory in the Gray. Almighty God, Creator, in these last days, storm has assailed us. Grayness has enveloped and mist surrounded, are, out, are going out and are coming in. Now again, thy glory clarifies. Thy light lifts up our hearts to thee, and night falls in peace. But through mist and storm and sunshine, the crops have ripened here and vine have grown. Thy constant care in all and everywhere is manifest. Almighty God, Redeemer, even as with our bodies, so also with our souls. Redeemer Christ, sunshine and storm, mist and grayness, eddy round our inner lives. But as we trace the pattern, looking back, we know that both darkness and light have been of thine ordaining for our own soul's health. Thy constant care in all and everywhere is manifest. Almighty God, sustainer, sun behind all suns, soul behind all souls, everlasting reconciler, siler of our whole beings. Show to us in everything we touch and in everyone we meet the continued assurance of thy presence around us, lest ever we think thee absent. In all created things thou art there. In every friend we have, the sunshine of thy presence is shown forth. In every enemy that seems to cross our path, Thou art there within the cloud to challenge us to love. Show to us the glory in the gray. Awake for us thy presence in the very storm. Till all our joys are seen as thee and all our trivial tasks emerge as priestly sacraments in the universal temple of thy love. Amen. Do you know that the church, which has never been a building but a people, including you. Do you know that the church that continues in service to the Lord in daily living through every season is also going through this season in the world? Even during pandemic, I tell you, people are being cared for here in this church. Children are being taught. Adults are being given the opportunity to learn and to serve. Our community is being blessed by the hands and heart and gifts of this congregation. And the Lord, who looks for the faithfulness of God's people, is finding more and more ways for us to serve. We are, each one of us, called to invest in God's work in the world. And that investment is happening here at First Presbyterian Church of Deerfield. Please, please remember the church in your giving so that the work of Christ's church here will not falter, not in this season and not in any other. You can find a way to give at firstpresdf.org. I'll leave it up to you, as does God. Amen. Sing what a friend we have in Jesus.
Isn't it fun to think that your real assignment in living faith today is actually to go out and find a friend to love, to love in a way that actually helps lift a weight that they are struggling with, that's paralyzing them, and to live your faith so brightly and so strongly that what you bring them is not just thanks for you, but thanks to God. So go out today, this week, find a friend who is paralyzed under weight. Bring them to Jesus and help that weight and your friend be lifted. May the Lord do the same for you. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, go in peace, love and serve the Lord. Amen. <laughs>